Um, just to welcome you all back to the International Trade and Prosperity Week. Uh, my name is Chris Southworth. I'll be introducing the speakers in a minute. We had a, a terrific session yesterday where we were listening to boardrooms and business leaders around the world on their perspectives on the context as well as an economic overview. If you missed those sessions, you can pick them up on YouTube. They've all been live streamed, so do download those. Uh, could I just say a special thank you to our uh, sponsors uh, for this week's events, JTI, money to go and Anigio. Uh, and if you haven't already, please do register for the sessions, use the networking facilities that are available on the Swap Card platform, and don't forget to use the chat room for conversation and the Q&A function to ask the speakers questions uh, towards the end of the panel. So we're going to kick off this morning with a keynote from Will Lockhart, who's the Deputy Director of International Environment Negotiations in the UK, working for the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Will, uh, if i like to bring you on screen, Will is our key contact in the UK government who we work very closely with on this biodiversity and preserving nature agenda. So without any further delay, Will, I'd like to hand over to you to say a few words. Morning. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, thank you, uh, everybody, for having me, ICC, for organising another fantastic uh, few days of events and for organising this panel in particular. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, at what is a very busy time, uh, a busy time for all of us, I think, uh, who work on these agendas. Um, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Will Lockhart. I am uh, the Joint Head of International Environment Negotiations in DEFRA. Um, I'm also the lead negotiator um, for the UK uh, on um, the Convention for Biological Diversity, which, as many of you know, um, has a, a COP meeting, another COP meeting, COP 15.2 in Montreal um, in, uh, well, I was going to say in a few months. It's actually six weeks and two days. We're doing the countdown now, so it must be important. It must be close. Um, so I'm just going to talk uh, for a few minutes about, uh, you know, what the CBD is and why the CBD matters, um, why the UK is placing uh, such a great deal of importance on the CBD uh, this year in particular. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about um, about you uh, and why the CBD matters um, for you uh, and, and, and how you can actually help us. I think you will have a very um, positive and really important role to play uh, in the negotiations that are coming up. Um, so... Just a bit of background. I think some of you will know this, but 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 um, in case you 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 know, not everyone will be uh, as familiar. Um, so the CBD is the Convention on Biological Diversity. It was uh, adopted in 1992 um, at the Rio Earth Summit. Um, it was adopted alongside uh, two other UN conventions, um, the UN uh, Convention to Combat Desertification, and of course the much more famous UN framework convention on climate change we of course we had cop 26 in glasgow last year um, and that was the cop that met under the unf triple c um but similarly under the under the cbd uh, we have a series of cops um, that take place every few years as well um in uh 2010 uh, CBD parties, 196 of us, got together to agree a set of targets and attempt to sort of uh, tackle the global problem of biodiversity loss. Agreed a set of targets, which were called the Aichi targets because they were adopted in uh, Aichi in Japan. Um, and in 2019, the community, the global community, got together and said, you know, how have we done? Um, and the answer is that as a global community, uh, we've unfortunately failed to deliver any of the Aichi targets. Uh, none of them were met at the global level. It's a you know, hugely sobering sort of realisation that, you know, nine years of um, effort, uh, without doubt, um, but ultimately uh, missed ambition. Um, so the parties to the convention, the parties to the CBD are now working uh, together um, to sort of learn from the mistakes uh, of, that, of that process um, and to come together in Montreal to agree a new set of targets, a new set of targets that will run to 2030. Um, a set of targets, uh, as I say, um, you know, whose, whose sort of job and ambition it is to learn from the mistakes of Aichi and, and in effect to put, to put nature on a path to recovery. Um, it's a hugely ambitious agenda. There's a huge amount to get through. Um, and, you know, uh, it's going to be a tremendously difficult path, uh, you know, to get there um, by 2030. Um, how are we doing? How's it going? So um, the first problem, of course, is that we've had a global pandemic, uh, you know, in the meantime. So um, this COP was originally meant to take place in 2020. It would have taken place in Kunming in China. Um, the pandemic meant that we'd been delayed. Uh, we met virtually uh, 
last year um we were hosted in Kunming virtually it was a fantastic event um for what was called the first part of cop 15 so cop 15.1 um, and that was designed to sort of maintain momentum despite the fact of the pandemic um we've also met uh in person since then we've had a big negotiating round in geneva some of you were there huge thanks for your for your positive contributions there um and we had another negotiating round in uh nairobi our sense coming out of those meetings is that um parties are, are hugely engaged right there's a lot of interest there's a lot of focus there's a lot of drive um but that we are not yet some of you will have read about this we are not yet at the point where the negotiations necessarily are making the progress that we would like to see um and part of that i think was because we have struggled to lock down a final date uh, and location for cop now the great news is that that is now happening it's going to happen as i say in montreal it's going to start on the 7th of december and um, there'll be a short meeting beforehand from the 3rd of december which will be um a, a sort of a preparatory meeting um and then we'll jump in on the 7th uh in montreal um to to, to have this cop and to finalize um these negotiations it's going to be in person um ngos will be there businesses will be there we're hoping uh, that world leaders will be able to attend um as well so you know, what, why does this matter? Well, you know, I, I probably don't need to tell you uh, some of this, um, but I think, you know, from the UK government's perspective, the reality is that biodiversity loss um, is just as desperate and just as urgent uh, as, as climate change. Um, we are losing nature faster than ever before. Uh, and this matters. It matters for all of us. It matters for us as consumers. It matters. Uh, uh, it matters to us as producers in, in, in many of your cases. Um, it matters to us as people who consume food and drink, um, you know, and, and it matters to us really as, as global citizens of the world. Um, as we saw last week, I mean, it's just, you know, endless sort of reports and summaries of, of how badly things are going. But um, the WWF Living Planet report was released last Thursday. Um, global wildlife populations have plummeted by 70% on average since 1970. Um, why does this matter right i mean you could you know you could sort of take the very hard nosed sort of uh, you know line and say well all right you know fine we're losing nature we're losing animals but you know things seem to be going okay don't they well i think the reality is that things certainly aren't going okay um as russia's uh, you know brutal invasion of ukraine has uh, you know um really sort of brought home to us our global food systems are you know relatively fragile and um, so uh, the reality is that we haven't seen uh, situations of widespread hunger in Europe, but there's definitely been profound impacts on food supply chains in the north of Africa as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There's been huge impacts on, uh, you know, the cost of food in the UK, which are, you know, obviously causing, uh, you know, inflationary pressures, which are impacting on all of us, both uh, as consumers, but also in, in your instances, in many of your instances as businesses as well. Um, you know, there is no doubt that part of our sort of the 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 the, the relative uh, you know um, the relatively profound impact of, of of the Russian invasion of Ukraine stems from the fact that our food supply uh, systems are not as diverse as they necessarily could be, um, and the Convention on Biological Diversity is all about ensuring that across that global system we are pursuing a relationship with nature that values diversity, values biodiversity um, for the sort of uh, you know as I say the value that it actually provides. Um, there's also very crudely, uh, you know, an economic bottom line here. So uh, nature, um, we, we derive significant value from nature. It adds a huge amount to the global economy. I'm sure that we've all read parts of the Dasgupta report. We know that um, the World Economic Forum have estimated that $44 trillion of economic value, uh, that's half of global GDP, is moderately or highly dependent on nature. Um, we know that certain sectors are tremendously, uh, you know, um, reliant on nature. So chemicals, materials, uh, real estate, mining, metals, transport, retail, consumer goods, you know, the list goes on. Um, you know, huge numbers of businesses around the world rely directly on extracting value from nature uh, um, in a way which uh, more or less, um, and, and it, clearly I recognize that, um, you know, uh, every business is, is, is completely unique and distinct, but which more or less don't value nature um, for the actually non-renewable resource, but in many instances it is. Um, I think there's, you know, amongst all of that, quite difficult news there's there's positive movement so we know that ministers of finance central banks financial supervisors um, regulatory authorities are increasingly recognizing that uh, you know nature has a value and it is a value that is not uh, limitless but the question is how do we respond to that as a global community and as a business community um, and one answer is by uh, you know working together at the cbd 
Um, so what does the UK want to achieve at the CBD? Um, we want to halt and reverse biodiversity loss globally by 2030. So we need a headline commitment. Um, some people call this the sort of Paris moment for nature. So we all know about the 1.5 uh, commitment of Paris. This is the Paris moment for nature, halting and reversing biodiversity loss by 2030. Um, that's the headline. Then we want to see a series of commitments to help us actually get there. So we want to protect 30% of the land and ocean globally by 2030. That's a sort of an area-based conservation target. We want to strengthen the mechanisms that hold countries to account. So um, one of the key learnings from that Aichi process I talked about before was that we can't just let sort of countries go away um, and you know hope that everybody does what they said they do. Unfortunately, the global experience is that we need something that's a little bit, little bit tighter than that for everybody. Um, and so we want to strengthen what we call the reporting and accountability mechanisms. We're going to need to find a solution on digital sequence information. Now, some of you will be immensely familiar with digital sequence information, others um, won't be. And I don't propose to spend the next three hours explaining what it is. Um, um, but the reality is that we need to find a solution there um, that will deliver um, uh, for the Africa group in particular. Um, and I think above all, and this is really important, we need to make sure that there is agreement, commitment around the world to significantly increasing the resources from all sources that flow into nature. So this is talking about, uh, you know, um, realigning uh, environmentally harmful subsidies to make sure that they are no longer doing environmental harm. And in many instances, that unlocked cash is actually flowing into nature. We need to increase the amount of public finance, taxpayer money that's flowing into nature, flowing into nature domestically, so in our case within the UK, but also internationally, supporting our partners um, you know, around the world. We need to work closely with the multilateral development banks to ensure that they're financing nature positive uh, projects around the world. Um, and really, we need to work closely with you um, as businesses. Uh, we need to work closely to make sure that your investments and your supply chains are working in a way that um, you know is beneficial for nature, um, rather than uh, you know inadvertently depleting it. Um, how do we do that? I think you know from your perspective, I recognise that. Um, trying to sort of, uh, there's, there's at least the perception, I think I'd describe it as that, there's a perception of potentially a first mover disadvantage, right? So, uh, you know, it's many businesses now recognize the need um, to tackle climate change. They recognize that and they're embedding that into their processes. Nature, okay, gosh, it feels like another set of commitments, another set of costs, another set of challenges. Um, and it can feel, I think, I'm sure it feels, um, that there might be uh, at least a perception that if you move first, you're going to be at an economic disadvantage. I think, um, I think I'd like to say a couple of things on that. The first thing I'd say is that British consumers in particular, so if any of you do business either directly or indirectly in Britain, I think British consumers, European consumers are, are good at this, right? They care about these issues. They want to spend their you know, uh, their pound or their euro in a way which is broadly beneficial for nature. More and more we're seeing that. I'm certainly feeling increasingly under pressure from consumers in Britain to make sure that the government, uh, you know, is taking action on biodiversity. So I think, you know, to that extent, moving first or moving quickly can actually become something of an economic advantage. The other thing to say is that the CBD is your opportunity to level that playing field. So the CBD is a global agreement. The CBD contains a target, target 15, which many of you talk about, um, you know, uh, with me. Um, target 15 is uh, a target that seeks to require businesses to report on their nature related risks and their nature uh, and, and to disclose those nature related risks. And um, so some of you will be familiar with the TNFD framework. That's um, not the, C the, the CBD framework currently doesn't mention TNFD, but it's clearly moving, moving towards that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the point about the CBD is that it's global. So if we're able to land quite a stretching, quite a difficult, quite an ambitious target 15, what it will mean is that essentially all the businesses along your supply chains and indeed all the businesses with whom you might be in competition um, will broadly be under the same expectation with, expect, with, with, with respect to nature risk and nature reporting at least. So what I'd say is that the CBD is really our opportunity to try and level that global playing field in a way which we think would be good for business um, and good for nature. Um, 
what is it that you can do? How can you help us? Well, by being here, you're already helping. Um, by working with the ICC, by working with the UK Biodiversity and Business Forum, um, by working with any of the business organisations that are that are that are sort of directly involved with the CBD, um, you're you know you're engaging with me, you're engaging with my ministers, and you're making clear that this matters. Um, you know, continue to write to us, continue to get involved. Social media, all this stuff matters. It, it makes a difference. Um, there's uh, you know the Get Nature Positive campaign, which is um, you know run by the CBI. It's got a nature book it's a fantastic resource the tnfd do get involved they're still running different forms of tests and trials which i think um you know you'll be really interested in um but i think the basic point and i don't say this lightly um is lobby me lobby me and lobby the governments along your supply chains make sure that we know that business cares because the more that we know business cares the more that we can drive that through the negotiations um and we can make sure that uh you know you guys are contributing in the way that um i know that you want to um, I'll leave it there. I'm going to stick around and I'll take questions a bit later. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks very much, Will. It's a good advice there. That actually chimes in very well with uh, the conversations yesterday about the need to speak up, speak out, uh, and the need to engage with governments and, and provide constructive solutions. And I think it also ties in with probably some of what we'll talk about this afternoon on the climate side is, is from a business point of view, uh, in the context of global value chains, looking at this as an innovation challenge, engaging right across that whole stakeholder base and turning the whole thing on its head uh, to come up with inventive uh, solutions to the problem and not seeing it as a problem in itself, but seeing it as an opportunity, a business, a big, big business opportunity. So just for those that aren't aware of COP15, the, there are quite a number of delegations going out there. If you are going out there, please do get in contact with either ourselves uh, or your ICC teams or your lead business organizations, the more we are working together on the ground in these big events, the bigger the impact we have, the clearer the messaging uh, and the clearer the, 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 the message that governments hear, all governments uh, in that one place. So that's a real opportunity for everybody. Um, I'd like to just introduce Mark now, Dr. Mark Johnson, who's the strategy lead for nature-based solutions at BP, one of our largest and biggest uh, um, companies in the UK uh, and global companies for that matter. He's also one of the founders of the UK Business and Biodiversity Forum, which has really been a game changer in creating a forum and a platform uh, for business to engage constructively with government. Mark, can I hand over to you uh, to for the panel discussion? Thank you. Of course. Thanks so much, Chris. And thanks so much, Will, for that uh, fascinating insights um, and overview of the CBD and the international biodiversity policy pace, pace. And I suppose we'll take up on your offer, Will. First of all, in terms of, yes, absolutely, let's all engage on this process um, and engage on sort of international biodiversity as a whole. And of course, your offer to lobby you. So there we are. So we have an opportunity to reach out to DEFRA and to make sure we get the business voice heard um, into these discussions, which is really, really important. So first of all, thank you very much for your time um, today and for joining the discussion. A quick reminder, if you do have any questions at any time to Will or to any of the panelists, please do remember to put them in the Q&A and we'll try and address those as we go on today. Um, so as highlighted, I'm going to be chairing this first session. First of all, a quick couple of reminders. Um, as Will they highlighted, you know, nature's under threat. Um, you know, over a million species globally are under threat of extinction and it's highlighted that action is needed. That threat and that loss of biodiversity is starting to see impact, economic impacts, impacts on sustainable livelihood. Etc. Um, a few years ago, it best, the Intergovernment Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services launched a report on the status of nature, and they highlighted five key drivers behind that, that, that nature loss or that loss in biodiversity. Change in the use of land and, and sea, such as deforestation, overexploitation of natural resources, um, such as fisheries or timber, climate change, of course pollution and the spread um, of invasive species globally, all impacting on biodiversity. Of course, there are other drivers as well, but they're the key drivers which we really need to be addressing globally to address and reverse this loss in biodiversity. Um, but as Will has very nicely highlighted, these things are all interconnected. Climate, nature, the economy are all interlinked. And of course, part of that trade is a really important part of that process. Um, so understanding the impact of trade on biodiversity is critical, and then of course taking actions to reduce that loss and also to move to a much, much more sustainable um, trade system. So on that, um, let me have great pleasure in introducing, introducing our panelists today. Um, we have a great panel, have a range of different expertise and background. So I introduce the 
Bruce from uh, Nature Metrics. Hi, Kat. We've got Alex Pelton from Barrett Development and Rebecca Breswell from Land Life Company. So thank you very much for joining. Um, always keen to have this as introduction is as discussive and interactive as possible. Um, but first of all, perhaps first of all, Kat, if I can hand over to you first of all, um, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about Nature Metrics and what you do. And then perhaps get your your initial thoughts or reactions on to all, the, all the issues which Will raised just a few minutes ago. So, Kat, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Will, for the um, great introduction. Um, my name is Kat Bruce. Um, I am the founder of Nature Metrics, um, which is a fast-growing VC-backed nature tech company uh, measuring biodiversity using DNA from the environment. Uh, the fact that we have now fast-growing VC-backed nature tech companies says um, a lot itself about how far we've come in the last five or six years. Uh, because when I founded Nature Metrics um, about, oh gosh, in 2015. Um, it was a really very niche thing to be doing, to be trying to start a business measuring biodiversity. Um, and there was a lot of doubts from my initial investors about whether there was really a commercial market for that. And, you know, we, it, that's not something that, that we're challenged on now, um, which, which is brilliant. Um, but yeah, my, my background was as a biodiversity scientist and I really set up the company because during my PhD, I just suddenly realized um, how little data and information there was out there to inform good decision making around environmental management um, and biodiversity. Um, and uh, particularly as biodiversity has sort of shot up the agenda of realized the urgency of addressing the biodiversity crisis alongside the, the climate crisis, um, the amount of data that's, that's out there um, is just really not fit for purpose. Um, so I became something of an accidental entrepreneur um, because we had this great tool that allowed us to generate data at, at large scales um, on the ground. Um, and today at Nature Matrix, we're working with um, around, around 500 different clients in more than 90 different countries um, doing biodiversity measurement. Um, so that was working with businesses, NGOs, governments, um, helping them to do things like environmental impact assessments, um, evaluating conservation outcomes, um, and generally mapping biodiversity and nature across landscapes um, to inform decision-making. I think one of the biggest trends that we've seen over the last couple of years, and this has happened very, very fast, is that the sorts of uh, businesses that are coming to us are, are are changing or growing from just the businesses who have always had to do some biodiversity assessment and have a sort of legacy of doing that and sort of working within fairly regulated environments. Um, to businesses that are coming and suddenly realizing that they're going to have to do something about biodiversity for the first time. And I think these are the, these are the sorts of businesses um, that Will mentioned who are seeing, see, well, both, both they are, they're responding to the expected um, sort of increased regulation in this area and, the, and the, the, the sort of expected requirements that we will have to disclose biodiversity impacts. They're also realizing that these risks and um, dependencies on nature are very real and very uh, material to their businesses and their long-term um, sustainability um, and seeing opportunities um, in, in being sort of first movers in, in this space. Um, so yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about data and the importance of measurement and really the importance of on the ground measurement. Um, a lot of nature and biodiversity can feel a long way away from some businesses, um, particularly if you know you're, it, the, the real impact is right at the other end of a supply chain. Um, the thing to remember with nature is that it is place based. So somewhere, whatever you do to try and improve your impact, whatever, um, and, and that can be, a, you know, yeah, feel a long way away from the ground. Somewhere that has to lead to a real change in an actual place on the ground. And we need to know whether that's working. Um, and if it's not working, we need to adapt the things that we're doing so that they do work because we don't have very much time at all to make a very significant change. That Data is then a great way of communicating through different through different parts of the state of the supply chain um, and of connecting very different sorts of stakeholders who are going to have to work together um, to solve this crisis. So we're talking about you know, things like, gosh, banks and ecologists having to work together um, who don't trust each other, have no history of working together. Um, and if you they don't speak the same language, so you say the word taxonomy and everybody falls to pieces because they all mean interpret it as meaning different things. Um, but if you show people how things are changing on the ground in response to um, an action or a change in management, um, then that's something that everybody um, can coalesce around. Um, so yeah, that's my sort of main main take home is, is, is around the place-based um, 
place-based aspect of nature, um, even if you're working within a supply chain. Brilliant. Thanks much, Kat. A um, lot of takeaways there. I picked up regulations, risk, dependencies, and place based all in there. And I think make a really good point that you know, we are on this journey and business on this journey. And we have some companies who are sort of perhaps seen as leading in the space and biodiversity, but also have a long tail. There's a lot of companies out there and probably long companies on the line here just really starting to understand what is biodiversity, what does that actually mean. And although many businesses may be quite distant from biodiversity they might not have a site or such or cetera they still have an impact may have dependency on, on nature either directly or indirectly so uh, great i like your focus about the place based <laughs> um aspects of biodiversity on which point if i can introduce alex who obviously probably has does a lot of that sort of place-based biodiversity aspects so alex over to you and what you're doing about thank you mark um good afternoon good morning good evening to everybody on the call thank you for having me along um i'm alex felton the group biodiversity manager for barrett developments plc um, for those of you who don't know Barrett, we have three residential uh, building brands. We do um, we work we operate in England, Scotland, and Wales. We also have a commercial arm. Uh, cumulatively, we, we build around eighteen thousand new homes uh, a year. So, by volume, we are at least the, the largest house builder in the UK. Um, now, I joined Barrett about three years ago. Prior to which, I worked in uh, ecological consultancy. Um, and my role has been largely to help shape the strategy for uh, Barrett in response to the Environment Act, which is a piece of legislation which came in uh, November of last year, which is going to require new development to quantify its impact on, on biodiversity uh, at a local level. So rather than having a qualitative assessment where we can rely on the opinion of an ecologist, we actually have to measure that impact and demonstrate that we're achieving a, a net gain. So a large part of my role was to bring that uh, industry ecological experience, bring it into a house building space, and help upskill and empower all of Barrett's functions from land acquisition right through to construction, right over to sales and marketing and, uh, and how we hand that over to the eventual custodians of our sites, which are our, our customers, new homeowners. Um, so there's been a, a lot of work to do with first understanding the requirements of, um, of the Environment Act or the Environment Bill as it was when I started, uh, how that impacted those different functions, what measures are needed to, to, uh, to change and how we best to how we best implement that to uh, professionals working in Barrett who do have quite a large remit and who aren't necessarily biodiversity specialists, so making it understandable uh, and interpretable to, to those uh, functions is uh, a continued challenge, but one which we are we are making some significant progress on. Great, thanks much, Alex. And um, just for the O's on the line, I wonder if you could expand a bit on your talk about net gain. Um, perhaps if you're able to expand just what actually is net gain. So I'm pretty sure there may be some companies who um, may not be that familiar with it. Um, sure. My apologies yeah. in advance, I suppose, you know, biodiversity space is full of jargon. That's many sort of areas <laughs> actually are. Um, and often we take them from granted, including myself. Um, but perhaps if you can just explain a bit what, what, from your perspective, what net gain means for you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so very simply, we, we need to, in order to say that we've achieved a net gain, so going above what was created there in the first place, we need to understand what was what was there in the first instance. So um, when we when we would consider buying or, or developing on a new uh, site, we'd have to have a baseline established. So essentially a quantification of what habitats exist there already, how large they are, how in what in what condition they are, and whether they're in a, a strategically significant uh, location for um, nature for biodiversity. Um, DEFRA um, and National have been developing in consultation with, with lots of stakeholders a calculator metric which allows us to do that. Um, so once we have a baseline we, we know uh, how much biodiversity we would need to, to create. Now the Environment Act is, is uh, setting a minimum target of 10% more than that baseline so uh, that, that gives us that gives us something to aim for. Some local authorities may ask for more but the minimum set by the Environment Act is 10 and then effectively we would apply what we what we call the mitigation hierarchy, which is a series of sequential steps that allows us to, or, or best uh, informs how to treat different habitats present on site. Um, those which we which are best to, to, to retain for their very inherent value, those which we can enhance because they might be in poor condition uh, and what we might need to put back, what we might need to recreate um, either on site or off site uh, through uh, either landscaping or through um, contribution to an offset scheme which might be run by uh, local authorities it might be run by environmental ngos taken together we have to have a, a pre and post development score obviously that that post development score has to exceed the, the pre-development score by uh, by at least 10 percent 
Great. Thanks much, Alex. To me, that sounds rather complicated, but uh, uh, this is where it comes back to what Kat was saying in terms of having that specialist knowledge in, in house um, to be understand exactly what's needed. So thank you. Okay, so let's, let's pass on to Rebecca. And to Rebecca, over to you. Thank you. Great. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for uh, for having us all today. Much appreciated. Uh, my name is Rebecca Braswell. I'm uh, the CEO and one of the founding members of Land Life. Our mission as a company is to help restore the world's 2 billion hectares of degraded land. Just for context for everyone, that is the size of China and the US combined. Um, that is the scope that we're talking about in terms of literally physical nature uh, being lost. And we take a very um, science-driven and technology-driven approach to our nature restoration projects because um, as you can imagine, we have a hard time even understanding what has been lost. Uh, so to understand the impact uh, that deforestation has had on biodiversity, even to get our heads around that has been difficult. Imagine trying to reverse that or restart that or regenerate that. It, it, uh, it's a very difficult task because nature has taken millennia to form the intricacies of, of what has been created that can be you know, wiped out in minutes or, or over decades. So to restart that, we are, you know, we're, we're drawing as much as we can from, from science and technology to try to recreate um, those interactions in, in nature because how we do this is going to be very important. Um, you know, there's a, I, I, we appreciate that there's a lot of, a lot more enthusiasm and focus on nature globally. It's really happened over the, the past couple of years, but there has been a rush therefore to act. And a lot of the questions about what is the right species in the right place at the right time are, are skipped over. Um, so we take a real focus on, um, on that process of science driven reforestation. So looking at what used to exist there, but also at future climate scenarios so that we can redesign resilient landscapes, right? Uh, the bio, it, you know, it, sometimes I think about my kids and, and super glue, you know, we're trying to, uh, we've broken something. I've, I've seen their efforts at trying to glue things together and to, to rebuild it. And I think we, we run that risk as well here in, in terms of how we try to regenerate the biodiversity that's been lost. It, it's not as simple as gluing something uh, back together. And so we need to take all of the data possible, which is why I really echo what uh, Kat was saying about creating baselines, about using metrics to understand um, what exists, what should exist, and what is the what is the path between those um, between those two points. And I think um, that is going to be a challenge. A, a couple of thoughts on on where we're headed with this COP. Um, there's such an emphasis on conservation, which is obviously critical, as Will mentioned, you know, we need to halt biodiversity lost, but that is going to be insufficient. All of the all of the science points to, you know, just halting the destruction that we're doing today is not going to be sufficient to secure our global su supply chains and all of the benefits that we receive from nature. We're also going to have to regenerate. So how do we bring that that focus into these conversations on biodiversity? Um, the th second thing I would say about where we're heading with all of these different conferences for, for biodiversity, there isn't that clear North Star yet. Um, you know, I think uh, for all of its faults, I mean, two degrees, I remember for years, people just couldn't get, I mean, what does two degrees mean? How do I get my head around it? CO2, you can't see it, you can't touch it. But people do understand it now because the messaging around it has been very clear. We need to get to zero. You know, net zero is, is a very clear campaign. Two degrees is a very clear campaign. And, you know, we're talking about businesses and people and communities trying to understand how they can contribute. And they simply do not have the bandwidth to um, absorb, you know, a complicated direction here. So we do need, even, in, even if it's oversimplified, we do need a clear North Star here for, for biodiversity, um, which is all the more complicated in that it is, uh, as Kat mentioned, very site specific. So how do we create a North, a North Star for the global community when you need something that is very, you know, biome specific, et cetera. Um, but the, you know, I, I can get, you know, you can get caught in your head about what this all means and uh, and how negative it is. But I would like to emphasize that, you know, this is possible. It is possible to restore nature in our lifetime. When we started Land Life eight years ago, you know, and there were three of us in one room, one of the first things we did was pull out a, a spreadsheet to make sure that what we were setting out to do was uh, economically and physically possible. And the reality is, is that there is enough technology, there is enough scientific knowledge 
Um, increasingly, there's more awareness, there's more funding, um, and there's more uh, willpower to to make to make this happen. So if I if I could end on a more positive note, it is possible to restore nature in our lifetime. It is possible that you know the the trees that we're planting today will be there in the future uh, for future generations, and it's not irrevocably lost. But there is definitely a timeline and a pressure and a real question on how we're going to do this um, besides just setting the goals. Brilliant. Thanks much, Rebecca. Um, uh, fantastic. Um, a couple of things I absolutely love your your ambition um, and motivation behind that and, and also the fact it came back down to a spreadsheet. Um, yeah. So it's brilliant. So thank you very much for sharing that. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I love the idea you talk about um, you know, glue back nature. Um, and that's what I, um, I just hope we glue it back in the right way um, <laughs> for future generations. So brilliant. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Panis. Um, our opportunity now to sort of open up a few more questions. And actually, while we have Will here, perhaps if I can ask Will to come back online. Thank you much, Will. Um, a couple of questions have come in, in the chat, and it was sort of feeds into um, the, the, the questions that are going to raise the panel as well in terms of um, wondering you know, what should we actually expect from COP15? Are we going to be expecting this big, high-level, ambitious targets? Is there going to be compromise? Um, I realize that's obviously very difficult, you know, starting to, and starting to um, a crystal ball, but I just want to have any reflections on what we can expect or what businesses can expect um, out of COP15. Thanks, Will. It's, it's a really good question. Um, so I think, I think there's no question that in terms of the in terms of the carnival and the public moment, it will be smaller than a UNFCCC COP. I think there's no question about that. Um, both because of the pandemic, which means it's kind of moved location at relatively short notice, but also because you know, as, as we know, the CBD isn't such a kind of a mature and sort of well recognised public entity. Um, that said. I think it's going to feel quite big. Um, you know, I, you'll all have seen this is covered in quite a few, uh, you know, of the major media outlets. Uh, you know, I give a lot of interviews to the global media. Um, you know, it is it is really rising in kind of, uh, you know, um, visibility, I guess. Um, I think that there's opportunities for you to be there uh, influencing the negotiations. There's going to be a lot of side events, um, you know, outside of the negotiating room. There's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, further events outside of, even the conference center, right? Just all around Montreal uh, and globally, virtual events as well. I think there's, you know, going to be quite a push. Um, there is talk of a, of leaders coming. So, uh, you know, some of you will have seen again in the press, you know, there's discussions about whether world leaders will attend. If world leaders attend, there's a possibility too for business leaders to attend. Um, so I think, you know, that it, we're six weeks out, there's still a few question marks, but I think it's going to feel quite, um, you know, uh, busy. Um, in terms of the negotiations themselves, well, I mean, it's, you know, I could talk about it all day. Um, the the geopolitical headwinds are against us, right? So the, you know, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine means that, you know, uh, um, there are financial pressures on, um, you know, every government, uh, you know, both as a result of, of, you know, funding the defense, but also as a result of tackling some of the cost of living crises that have, um, that have emerged. Um, that doesn't help. Um, you know, there are, you know, that sort of becomes bigger questions about the role of multilateralism in a kind of a difficult geopolitical context and so on. But I mean, I am constantly struck when I sit in that room at, at how, you know, dedicated and committed the individual negotiators are to try and make this the best deal they can for nature. So I, I'm quietly optimistic, um, never, you know, never count your chickens, especially, uh, you know, um, because they're probably a sort of a monoculture chicken that, you know, actually we need to improve the biodiversity of. But, but, the, but the point is, I, you know, I, I think there's all to play for, and I think it still has the potential to be a really good outcome. Brilliant. Thanks much, Will. Um, and I thank you for that. And I uh, completely agree with all the, all the comments there. And I suppose that anything I'll add as well is that, that actually for businesses, we don't shouldn't necessarily need to wait for ambitious targets under the CBD. That actually there's already a lot of focus from, as Kedah highlighted, investors, financial institutions, society for business to be taking action. Um, and of course, it doesn't stop businesses or other groups, of course, making ambitious targets, um, regardless of whether any sort of UN, um, UN CBD negotiations and from, from COP15. So all really good points. So perhaps I just open out that to, up, to, up to the panel and, and particularly Hans, what do you see as the key challenges and opportunities for businesses around um, uh, post COP15, if you think beyond sort of December? Um, Kat, I know you've been following also a lot of these negotiations quite closely. I just wonder if you're able to perhaps give your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. And actually, just um, just before that, just to add on to what 
Will was just saying, one of the things that I think has been really um, encouraging and possibly slightly surprising has been the strength of the business voice in favour of ambitious targets for um, the global biodiversity framework. I think this is probably the first time that we've seen the business voice sort of almost pushing that that ambition. It's been really clear through some of the open-ended working group meetings. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, that's really amazing to see. Um, in terms of challenges, I think obviously we've got a very fast pace of change um, and it's quite difficult for, for businesses to keep up with it all and to figure out exactly what, what all of this means that they should do. And I think, um, yes, not just leaning on, on the sort of words of the regulations, but actually sort of thinking through, um, you know, what are the meaningful and material impacts and dependencies that each business has and, and sort of how and they just start to engage. I think there's a real strong message coming through about just you know start anywhere do the, there are no brain you know no brainer actions that that everybody can can be starting to do even if the sort of regulatory environment is still settling and, and there's a lot of complexity out there um one of the uh one of the biggest challenges with biodiversity is the measurement side of it i think as rebecca alluded to really nicely you know it, it's it's more difficult to set a sort of yeah as you said a, a north star um here Carbon is one molecule and it's the same everywhere in the world. Biodiversity is all life on earth and it's different in every place. So, um, you know, and actually the, the wildlife that we tend to focus on when we think of biodiversity tends not to be the aspects of biodiversity that are actually most closely linked to the functioning and resilience of ecosystems. So we need to be able to develop over time more sophisticated metrics and tools for measuring the state of ecosystems and the state of nature and starting to be able to link those metrics to value um, but that will take time so again you know there's there are things we can be doing in the meantime to be starting to add to um, the sort of the knowledge base um, on on nature um, but I think that there are some you know that as ever when the when a, an area is disrupted there are lots of opportunities for um, businesses that are that are innovative that are thinking forward that are um, sort of there in, in the early um, stages um, I think a lot of businesses are, are recognizing that um, and um, nature is I think a nature again as Rebecca said uh, nature has this amazing ability to bounce back um, given half a chance and so it's something you can really appreciate within time frames that are you know meaningful and you can sort of really build positive feedback cycles and people love nature people care about nature in the way that they can't feel emotionally attached to a carbon molecule and that's really our sort of secret weapon in driving this and sort of building the engagement um sort of within and between companies um to sort of start making a real difference brilliant thanks much cat um Rebecca, any sort of reflections on that? I yeah, mean, I mean, maybe building on Kat's last point about the tangibility of nature, I, I sometimes want to, it just is so infuriating to always think about this in terms of like a periodic table, you know, like even as companies move from reducing their uh, CO2 emissions, you know, and, and electrification, I mean, has anyone seen a mine for lithium and for copper? I mean, we just need to look at things more holistically. Mm -hmm. And we have a biodiversity cop, we have a climate cop, and these are not words that really sink in with people. And as Kat mentioned, people love nature. Everyone can tell you about their first camping trip. They can tell you about their favorite park where they walk their dog. Nature is involved in our everyday lives and we are just not making it tangible enough to people and to businesses. Um, you know, in some respects, embracing a more holistic concept might be easier for businesses and communities and governments to absorb. Because when you do try to to break it down into all of these pieces, you you lose some of the interconnectedness and some of some of the meaning around it. So, I just uh, even nature based solutions. I, can we just? I would just like the word nature. It's a very simple word um, to be used a little bit more frequently in all of these conversations as a way to ground what we are trying to do, what we are dependent on uh, for our economies, for our uh, for our societies. And I think that that is um, a little bit lost and understandably in the intricacies of negotiations and very technical details. Um, but I think it's our job to make it easier uh, for everyone, including businesses, by bringing this more holistic concept of nature, which everyone can understand on some level, 
to to the forefront of the discussion because as Kat mentioned, you know, the metrics are going to take a very long time. They are site specific. The most important thing a lot about biodiversity is down in the soil and microbes, and that is very hard for people to get their heads around and and to and to value. So we are going to need to make it not more simple, but I would say more holistic to get people on board with this uh, with this momentum. Great, thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, yeah, no, I, I like that uh, uh, the, 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 um, analysis there in terms of what we're looking at. In terms of one of the things you often hear is that your nature is complicated for the reasons we've all described, but actually the actions we take or the things we put in place don't need to be complicated, such as restoration of habitats, etc. So it's great. But and Alex, perhaps I'll come to you briefly in terms of what do you I, what do you see as the sort of some of the day to day challenges um, you're facing? Um, you know, we talk about sort of international policy space, but actually, you know, it all matters what happens actually in the field on the site. Um, and if you can maybe expand on that for me. Yeah, uh, there's a lot to be to be frank to to be getting to grips with. Um, like I said, we're asking we're asking people whose background is not in ecology and biodiversity to get to grips with something which is, um, and to make that understandable to, to them in a way which. You know, they, they can actually take those actions. We can provide and have provided, you know, toolkits and guidance. We've worked with the consultants, external consultants that work with them just to sort of bring. So, so you've got you've got the messaging coming from several different angles. You've got it coming internally and externally so that everybody is actually aligned on this point and that the end result is, you know, the outcome that we all see, which is improvements in in in, uh, in nature and biodiversity. One thing that we've well, I've experienced quite a lot of is um people's understanding intrinsically of what high and low value features might actually look like that's something that's um quite been quite stark but in terms of the in, in terms of implementation in terms of developing some of these resources we're quite fortunate to have a team there's myself there's also helen newell who's our group head of biodiversity we can you know between us we can we can have a good attempt with external help at, at, uh, at promoting this and embedding it and we can look at you know passive policy internally we can look at direct action on the ground um there's lots and lots of different mechanisms that we can we can start to implement this but having that clear approach um and clear guidance from central government that filters down to, to local government bearing in mind that we operate across three three uh, administrations is uh, is absolutely key um and the metric has its critics um and it has taken 10 years to get to the point where we where we are now um but it's been through multiple consultations. It's had a lot of involvement from different stakeholders. Um, and I think a lot of people are now getting to grips with it. One thing that we recognise it doesn't necessarily do is deal with species specific um, losses. It, it treats them as a, a proxy, I guess, for the, for the habitats that they might uh, otherwise occupy. So um, we're looking at essentially flipping it on its head a little bit and uh, you know providing guidance on how we might be able to design habitats that deliver for BNG biodiversity net gain, but also for uh, specific species. So it's, there's a lot of lots of different ways in which we can tackle this. But um, the point about starting somewhere is is absolutely key. It's it can be overwhelming, um, but making taking those first few steps is is paramount. Otherwise, nothing will ever happen. Really good point. Thank you much. That's a good good reflection on some of the day to day challenges you're facing. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I just want to come back to. Um, before we open up for questions, I just remind you, we've got quite a few questions coming in already, which is fantastic. So please keep them coming in. Um, I just want to come back to to uh, points which were raised in, in terms of, you know, in the UK and globally, we're facing significant economic and political uncertainties and change at the moment. Um, you're know, increasing energy prices, increasing cost of living, etc., um, which is difficult. I know it, it affects everybody. Um, um, from individuals to businesses to, to governments as well. I just wonder how you may have any reflections really on how this sort of external ex, um, uncertainties and change may impact the way businesses, businesses' ability to implement um, biodiversity or implement the priorities which come out of COP15 um, because there are so many things going on. I mean, you, Will, you highlighted that. I just wonder if there are any other sort of reflections on that or anything you think businesses should be thinking about in terms of when they're looking at this bigger picture of, of the this uncertainty in this space. I suppose perhaps, perhaps if Will, I'll perhaps come to you first, if that's okay. Um, and then perhaps to Kat, Rebecca. Okay. Yeah, of course. Look, I you know, I don't want to I um I don't want to pretend it's easy. Um and I don't want to lecture you either. I mean, you know, we've got on the panel we've got three people who are working at the cutting edge of you know um some really difficult uh, and challenging things so you know the audience will want to hear from them i you know i think that 
as as sort of a representative of government, what what we are trying to do is sort of incentivize and drive the right long term behavior changes, right? Um, while also recognizing that clearly, you know, there is a very very challenging, uh, you know, short term uh, sort of set of conditions that we find ourselves in. Um, I think uh, the 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 most helpful thing I can say, rather than sort of you know, <laughs> pretending to lecture you all on on the kind of impossibly difficult decisions that you all have to make every day, I think the the most helpful thing that I can say is that you know, um, sort of uh, successive uh, you know prime ministers and successive cabinets have been very very clear about the long term direction of travel on protecting and restoring nature, um, and that you know it is an economic fact, and you know we are trying to make it sort of a policy requirement as well that business need to be thinking about their impact on nature out to you know 2030 and 2050 we don't want um you know and and you know i think that is that is the the, the right thing we don't want to be telling businesses about precisely how you go about achieving those things in the short term or the next few years not least because of the global uncertainty um i mean i think that uh you know um I think the government historically has been quite good at understanding that businesses are the best people to understand how they respond, you know, how they should respond to, um, you know, uh, issues in the short term. So if you think about, you know, net zero or 1.5, you know, um, and the way that the government has chosen to approach those things, there's a lot of latitude on individual businesses to respond in the way that they think is most appropriate. Now, you can argue about whether that is right or wrong. You could say, actually, what you'd want is much clearer sort of centralised instruction from governments about, you know, what's expected of us and how we should go about doing it and um, but but as a rule what the government has done i think is kind of you know set out a kind of a clear sort of set of staging posts um you know and 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 has effectively less businesses to to you know um, manage the manage the journey there themselves um and i think you know like i say we, we are in a place where we're doing something very similar with nature you know um the government uh really is you know committed to leaving the environment in a better state than it found it it's committed to the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature and to halting and reversing biodiversity loss by 2030 so the question is how do you kind of um you know deliver deliver those things uh you know um in the shorter term um i think relatively freely right i don't see a direction of travel where uh, you know, anytime soon, the government is going to jump in and start putting in intermediate targets and specific sort of, you know, regulatory requirements that, you know, you must do X, Y, Z by 2024, 20, that just doesn't feel like the direction of travel. I think what you're going to come away from COP15 with is this kind of set of milestones and staging posts and a certain amount of freedom about the speed with which you try and get there. And indeed, the precise way, um, you know, the precise way that you do it too. I hope that's helpful. Um, both as an answer and indeed as a policy program. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rod. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sure, um, I'm sure a lot of business will be reassured about the aspect of flexibility, particularly at the moment because of these uncertainties in, in markets and globally. So thanks so much for that. Well, Rebecca, any sort of reflections on that too? Yeah, I have a, a slightly different perspective on that in that I think, you know, businesses, their, their core business is usually not related to understanding biodiversity or understanding climate. And so they do need more of a guideline of what they should be doing. And they that is not their focus. Their focus may be selling shoes and we need to let them focus on selling shoes. And we need to tell them how selling shoes impacts nature and what they should do about it so that they can, they can act and continue to focus on, on selling shoes in a responsible and sustainable way. And I think, you know, they need that grounding and that metric has to be moved to core operations of people's budgets and, um, and uh, an operational line item uh, in order for it to stick and whether the storms of political uncertainty, inflation, war, et cetera. I think a really good example was uh, when COVID started, we were really concerned that all of a sudden our business would evaporate, right? I mean, we're a nature restoration company. We thought we'd be the first budget cut uh, from companies um, that they would no longer invest in this. And actually our business took off during COVID because these companies had made net zero claims and they had made them publicly and they had put a roadmap to it. So unfortunately they had no choice but to follow through on those commitments uh, that involved you know, carbon removals as part of their as part of their process. And I think that that was really critical because we had fortunately just moved from being a nice to have, um, you know, it used to be CS, uh, CSR, right, focus to being a core operating line item. Um, and that protected kind of a focus on nature to weather 
um, some of these, uh, these changing global conditions, because understandably businesses will prioritize and they will react to whatever challenges they're being faced. And if they have a reason to cut resources or to deploy them somewhere else, whether it be war, inflation, or what have you, they will understandably do that. So having that grounding for businesses of what their commitments are in this arena is super important and understanding that they are maybe not the best place to design what that commitment should look like. They should have input, but we, you know, I agree with you, Will, we can't be too, uh, you know, uh, we can't delegate or be too specific because businesses need the agility, but they do need something broad that they can latch on to so that they can make those those commitments and, and focus on, you know, what the rest of their business does. Oh, great point. Thank you, for that, Rebecca. Uh, Kat, is there anything um, to add to that? Um, and I suppose perhaps any reflections also from you, Will, in terms of <laughs> the return towards good to have to get the discussion into the room. Kat, first of all, any, any additions to that? Uh, I think Rebecca's just said much more eloquently than I was going to, all of the things that I was going to say. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things we saw from, from COVID was that actually businesses are incredibly adaptable when we have to be. Um, and, and, and often there are new requirements and frameworks and, you know, and things that, that come in. And we see it ourselves, even as a small business, you know, when we do an investment round and get a new board and have new reporting requirements, um, it, it's a real pain to start with but once you do it you realize that there are a lot of you know un unforeseen benefits that come from having done that um one of the things with biodiversity that businesses have to do for example is really get their heads around their supply chains but there will be other benefits that come from doing that um and i think if we're you know the just keep coming back to the scale of the challenge that we have ahead of us in a really, really short frame of time. You know, we're talking about less than 10 years to make it to really sort of change the way that we interact with the natural world um, in a really transformational way. Um, and that has to be, you know, we have to mainstream this into businesses, not just those businesses that are sort of at the leading end and, make, and making voluntary commitments, because it'll be the voluntary commitments that are lost first when, um, circumstances change and everyone's belt tightens so yeah just really echo everything that Rebecca said Great. thanks much Kat. well an opportunity to return or any other questions thoughts then? yeah it's really it's really really helpful to hear I mean you know maybe I'm too sort of long in the tooth is that the you know the thing that I've learned working in government for you know far too many years we tend to be quite clunky right we tend to sort of you know you're not right you know the business community you innovate you're adaptive you're smart you know and the concern I think is always that you know what what are the tools that we have we can we can nudge right we can nudge we can you know we can um, incentivize and nudge and that tends to be a bit more reactive and a bit smarter but otherwise you know you get into this world of regulation which is perfectly appropriate in lots of different scenarios of course it is but it does tend to be clunky um and I I, I think you know maybe maybe you know um I'm just going to end on sort of a kind of a you know, the reality is probably somewhere in the middle, right? Um, if you look at something like the TNFD, which the government has done a huge amount of work supporting, it's it's a really sort of smart way of, of tackling the, exactly the exchange that we're having, having, which is basically saying, you know, um, let's create a framework that, uh, you know, sort of encourages or allows business, I should say, allows business to kind of go on this journey themselves and to, you know, understand their nature-related risks. Um, and then, you know, let's think about, I'm not, you know, um, not sort of, you know, causing any surprises when I say let's think about you know the role that government might have to play in making that mandatory right um we've made TCFD mandatory right so I'm not committing I'm going to be very clear I'm not committing that at this point that the government is going to mandate TNFD I am not committing that but the point is that it's clearly there as part of the kind of regulatory toolbox and it's it's a smart it's a smart metric right it's a smart thing right because it it requires a sort of a behavioral change uh, you know which will which will then you know kind of realign investment flows and so on and so forth. so there's there's definitely ways of meeting the two uh, meeting meeting in the middle um and I think uh you know uh, this is just another really sort of positive sign about the journey that we're all on is that you know over the next few years I think we should expect increasingly subtle conversations like this as we try to work out you know how to how to how businesses and, and you know the regulators can meet in the middle on nature action um and I think that is uh you know picking up on the point Kat made earlier that is you know even five years ago I think that would have been quite unthinkable yeah very true thank you now getting that balance is always always very tricky um but also regulation do build that level playing field but um 
but then there's good regulations and the bad regulations or can lead to um, unintentional consequences. So great, thank you very much everybody for the discussion. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in on the chat, which is great to see, so thank you. Um, uh, well, I'm gonna combine one sort of question, um, um, which is very similar to the discussion we've actually just had in terms of what can be done to join up the messages between climate and environment? We've got the other COP coming up, the COP27 coming up. Um, often biodiversity is referred as the other COP, but then someone has put the climate there in that space. So what can be done to join up the message between climate and the environment? Um, because environment sometimes feels like a poor neighbor um, to the focus on climate. Um, and perhaps reflection on that there in terms of um, how much flex in terms of learning from mistakes for applying the SDGs are, and, and uh, more, perhaps more widely the HE targets um, were the HE targets distract perhaps from the SDGs, for example, because they like a separate set of targets. Just wanted a discussion about how we join up this climate and environment and biodiversity um, policy space. Um, Kat, first of all, in terms of, no, no particular order, my body's putting you on the, on the hot seat. Any, any sort of thoughts on how we can do that from a, from a, from a business perspective? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, it will, again, if we're talking about efficiencies, um, actually tackling these two things together as part of one system um, is, is going to be much more um, efficient and much less costly than trying to address each one in, in silos. Um, I think we are seeing a sort of natural coming together of, of those two agendas through the sort of world of nature-based solutions and the recognition that we saw very strongly at COP26 that a huge part of our sort of global um, climate mitigation strategy is going to have to be driven by uh, nature and nature-based solutions. And that's going to require us to invest in conserving and, and restoring nature at huge scales. And I think, um, you know, we're seeing the, finance sector also start to bring those things together to sort of um, start channeling funding into those sort of nature-based um, solutions. Um, we're seeing, and one of the things that we're being asked a lot now by banks is how they can integrate biodiversity KPIs into um, uh, sustainability linked financial products, um, which currently just have climate um, KPIs and I think that's really 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 encouraging I think that the sort of financial incentives alongside the regulatory ones are going to be what really sort of start to, to move this field very quickly. That's a really good point thank you. Um, Rebecca any additions to to that and if you haven't you can say no that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah no I think it's you know again I, I struggle with this because they are very technical conversations and so I do mm. really understand why they need to be separate and I think the the negotiators and uh, the focus on you know targets etc need to be quite specific and separate. I think we could just do a lot better for businesses and for the public on joining the conversation if the technical conversations still need to happen separately in the background. That's understandable. But, you know, the very simple messages around stopping, you know, stop all harm and try to restore what's been lost are very applicable to both biodiversity and climate, right? And I think the trick is finding some of those messages that bridge both of those conversations for businesses and for people um, is, is something that can be done while the really hard technical work is still being done in, in the background. I mean, I, I, I do really appreciate the challenges that someone like Will faces uh, in, in negotiating these agreements and, and why I actually really enjoy going to COP instead of other conferences is that real work is happening in the background. There are a lot of people out there talking, but there's really hard uh, work happening and that needs to happen. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna oversimplify that, but I do think for businesses and for the public, like, uh, like Kat mentioned, simple metrics, how do we join the conversation more publicly uh, could have a lot of value and support the hard work that's happening in the background. Yep. Great, thanks Rebecca. Um, Alex, any sort of reflections on that? Um, I know you're coming from a quite different perspective in terms of how you manage things on a day-to-day -day basis, but you're joining up the climate environmental debate within a, within a company like yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking at the, the latter point on that, that second question around having a set of clear action steps required. I think that's absolutely key. Re Rebecca mentioned it earlier in terms of if a business like Barrett were to begin reporting on something like this, having those milestones, having those stage gates is, is key because we are a large organisation with a lot of employees to recognise what that, first of all, if we know what we need to do at certain points, we can start to 
build that capacity internally and uh, bring it in externally if we uh, recognize we've got a shortfall it's a big ship to steer and whilst we can be reactive i think proactivity is uh, is is really uh, valuable too if we there, there are obviously going to be links between climate and environment but i think at, at this point um having the two separate separated out and, and having clear requirements for each is still going to be important in the uh, at least in the sort of short to medium term thing great thanks alex um, so, I want to focus the discussion now back to um, trade and the value chain, um, obviously the, 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 the focus of these sessions. Um, so, I've got a couple of questions. Um, so, first of all, first one in terms of um, global value chains, you know, is there any advice perhaps you can give as a panel um, for global value chain managers on what they can do to drive scale or change within the global supply chain? Big question, very difficult because the global value chains are very complicated. Um, and I suppose on the back of that, um, the, the TNFD, which we've mentioned several times in terms of disclosures, does talk about to understand your impacts and dependencies and your nature related risks, not just from your own operations, but also in your value chain, um, which we know is difficult and, and challenging. Um, but I just wonder at this time, um, whether you have any thoughts on terms of that value chain um, and advice you can give to people who are looking to the value chain in terms of what they can be doing now, what needs to be done to understand the value chain. Um, I know that's quite a difficult question, <laughs> but, but um, anybody want to have a go with that first rather than picking on somebody? Yeah, I'll do that because I'd like to, to plug Kat's work while in the process. So I think, you know, uh, a big part of this is baselining uh, and really understanding what you you have to start with and, and what's your starting point. So for those in, in global value, uh, looking at global supply chains, just really understanding your baseline and impact on biodiversity. Um, we are now using nature metrics. We're going to pilot it this fall on our projects on our reforestation sites to see what the baseline biodiversity is of really depleted landscapes. So this is like post wildfire, post beetle kill, uh, degraded agricultural lands that mix. But we really want to understand what we're starting with. And so, you know, we, you know, regardless of this panel, we actually found nature metrics as a way to measure that because we were really kind of desperate to understand what was the baseline. I mean, you can physically see it, but we needed to understand what was happening uh, below ground as well. Um, so I think that that is a really easy first step and there are tools out there to measure that. So we've been talking about how difficult it is to find the right metrics. I mean, change in this field takes time, which no one seems to appreciate, right? Biodiversity and uh, nature restoration, they don't happen overnight. And we need to have patience to understand that some of the metrics are going to take 20 years to report on. But baselining is something that you can do today. And understanding your starting point is something that you can do today. And I, I would highly recommend doing that. Brilliant. Thanks, Becca. Um, great advice. That sounds simple. But in practice, how easy is that? And I think some of the supply chains or value chains in some of these businesses are huge. Um, and yeah. trying to trace it back to the source of where the actual impact actually is happening is really, really difficult. Um, Kat, your response to that? Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that, um, yeah, I spend a lot of time telling people just, just baseline, just measure what's there today and future proof yourself. Because whether you're trying to show impact or you're trying to show uh, uplift, um, you know, you can't do that if you didn't show where you started from. Um, I think this thing about um, communicating that information both ways through supply chains um, is is critical. Um, one of the biggest things that businesses can do is just start asking questions of their suppliers and their buyers. Um, Normalise biodiversity being part of the due diligence, part of the supplier um, information that's collected. What are you doing about biodiversity? Because that helps all businesses within the supply chain to make their own internal business case for why they should change things in their businesses to be more sort of nature positive. Um, you know, it, it, as we've sort of mentioned before, ev everyone in businesses, we're all people, right? So businesses are collections of people and people care about nature and a lot of time there are you know a lot of individual people within businesses who would love for their business to have a more positive impact on on nature so starting to normalize those questions and making businesses feel like they might lose work if they don't have a good enough biodiversity policy um, will enable that change to happen much faster that's good yeah well 
just i mean so what fantastic advice i mean the other thing i would try and do and, and you know i say this just because rebecca's right we're going to be working terribly hard is you know mention the cbd right i mean you know the point is that you know um those those sort of uh, businesses or individuals who are operating along your supply chains you know um in you know 195 other country cases right you know unless they um you know operate out of the the holy see you know uh they're going to be um their governments will be negotiating at the cbd too and you know the governments will be entering into the same set of commitments as the uk government hopes to enter into so i guess the point is that you know that what i'm trying to do is provide you with you know pressure at the very very far end of your supply chain right at the government at the you know input level of your supply chain um and so i you know i think the ideal is that eventually those two systems meet in the middle um and you know your suppliers are feeling that pressure from both sides uh, a positive pressure from both sides so yeah do excellent advice but you know mention the cbd too okay thanks much well um come back to sort of a partly related question um also links into our previous discussion around regulation um and this is a, about EU, UK delusional provisions. Um, so what is the panel's opinion on the EU and UK's due diligence provisions to make it illegal for larger businesses to trade forest risk commodities, um, you know, soy, palm oil, uh, beef, etc., producing deforested land and land illegally occupied in tropical countries? Now, piece of regulation, I'm not that familiar with it. I'm aware of it. But uh, in terms of anybody able to comment on that one, if we're not, that's fine. We can always follow it up afterwards. Might need to have, if not, just open up to anybody who wants to make any questions about that particular piece. Do you, um, and, and how can we make these, or how, and then we'll follow on the question, how do we make these regulations pos have a greater positive impact? I think it's often quite a, it's a, it's a question which we often have, perhaps we'll expand on, um, often a question we have in a, in a company in terms of, um, do we actually get involved in, in some of these more, um, environmentally unfriendly products like soy or beef, et cetera, or do we pull out of them completely? Or do we actually engage in it and get involved in it in order to change or increase standards? So it's often quite a, a bit of a dialogue. You know, is it better to be in and trying to improve the standards across them, or do we actually just not be involved in them at all? And I may come back to that question about in terms of making it illegal to use those products. Um, any thoughts? Sorry, I interrupted. No, not at all, it, but that was helpful. I mean, you know, it's, it's at, if you like, the harder end of, you know, the, the exchange we were having earlier about regulation versus, you know, behavioral mm. change and incentive. And I mean, I think, um, you know, it's uh, it's a it's a big tool, right, that, that, that the government has chosen to take forward there in the Environment Act. Um, and, uh, you know, um, it's going to require for some businesses in particular, you know, a real shift in, uh, you know, the way that they engage with their supply chains. Um, and we're having to do a lot of work, uh, you know, diplomatically, right, with the countries, uh, you know, that, that, that will be most affected by this so um it's a big shift and a big ask um but i think it 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 serves i think as an indicator of a really important direction of travel um which is that you know i don't imagine uh you know that um you know we're going to end up with a list of sort of you know 300 400 products that are at risk of you know that sort of you know put deforestation at risk or whatever i i don't imagine that any government will take us down that route but i that i think the point that that legislation is trying to send is quite clear, which is that, you know, consumers care about this, um, you know, governments care about this. And now we kind of need, you know, the investment patterns and the investment flows to follow. And this government in particular is willing to force that to happen if it has to. So quite, you know, quite an important message, I think, about, um, yeah, that kind of long term, that long term behavior change that we were talking mm. about earlier. Mm. Thanks much, Will. Um, I suppose Pete adding to that is in terms of if, you know if you are managing your supply chain, just making sure or at least tracing your products back so they are coming from a sustainable source. Um, and there's also a whole range of different certification processes out there for different products, some more complicated than others. Um, but no, that, you know, that's one point of call. But I'm not, not sure what percentage of timber or what or palm oil actually comes from a certified source, which is in in, in the global trade market. Um, I'm interested to get those figures. Um, I've got one, sort of one question, one specific question, I think, for, me, for you, Will. Uh, my apologies for going back to, to, to you. Um, and then I sort of got a one general question and then we sort of finish off from there. Um, so a question about COP15. How is COP15 connected to trade and environment? Are there negotiations going on at that level? And I suppose it comes back to the interconnection, uh, connection between the different conventions under the UN. Um, is, it, uh, is there a dialogue between the COP15, the CBD, and the World Trade Organization, for example? I just wonder if you're able to expand on that or not. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it goes on a, a absolutely, um, it goes on at absolutely every single level. So negotiator level that they, that, you know, conversations happen, uh, you know, so there are, there are um, central representatives, right? Each of the conventions and organizations has their own kind of lead, you know, and, and they meet, we get presentations, uh, you know, um, from individuals um, as well. I mean, they, they, they're, they're hugely uh, interlinked. And I sort of alluded to this at the very beginning, the, the global biodiversity framework, this, this, this thing that the UN community has decided to, to, to try and negotiate um you know it's an absolute beast right it's fundamentally resetting uh, humanity's relationship with nature so that means it touches on everything in every way um and uh you know it's it's huge so we are very sort of live to the interactions with trade patterns you know we talk a lot about uh you know subsidy reform um you know uh and so you know trade is is particularly sort of covered uh and you know live in that conversation um I think, you know, as a rule, um, one of the things uh, that I'm always keen to talk about is agriculture um, and food production. So, you know, um, one of the, we don't need to go into all the drivers of biodiversity loss right now, but um, clearly land use change is one of them. And one of the primary drivers of land use change is subsistence agriculture. And, you know, and the reality is that, you know, if we want to create sort of 30% of the global land and ocean to be protected, that doesn't mean completely immune from human activity, that would be absurd, but, you know, protected uh, and conserved and managed sustainably. And, um, you know, that is going to change, um, you know, production patterns in particular in agriculture. Um, and, you know, at a time of, of global food insecurity, um, we're going to need agriculture to do more. We're going to need it, you know, to work in a way which is more sustainable. Um, and so, you know, actually, I think, you know, the CBD drives, uh, again, sort of behavior change at the very, very very kind of bottom up level among a huge number of sectors. So it's not just trade, but, you know, agriculture, um, extractives, uh, you know, all sorts of industries. And um, they're very, very kind of live in everything we talk about. Great. Thanks so much, Will. Um, so moving on into um, the sort of the next question in that respect. Actually, before I move on to the next question, I was also perhaps highlight that obviously the we very much focus on the post 2020 global biodiversity framework under the CBD, but the CBD is also involved in a whole range of other activities as well and different different work streams, um, including trade, including the oceans, etc. So there's much more within the CBD and activities they're doing than or we're very much focused on the CB on the global biodiversity framework. There are other areas as well. Um, so um, I have sort of one general, one more general question, um, and I know I'm going to probably get my statistics wrong here, but for example, in the UK there are about five million businesses. Chris is going to correct me, I know that in a minute. Um, about 99.5% of those are SMEs. Um, so, you know, SMEs play a really critical role and they play a very critical role, as I've already highlighted in the supply chain, because a lot of them may have large businesses, but the small larger businesses are dependent on the smaller SMEs to provide the resources or, or, the, or the services. Um, I just want to have any views, um, and perhaps if I start with Kat, because, um, in terms of from an MS, um, SME perspective, what do you see the challenges and what when you sort of advice you specifically give to SMEs in this space because I know it's particularly challenging for them in this area yeah I think it's a great great question we often forget about the the SMEs I think you know when we talk about the um some of the simple actions that people can get involved with now um SMEs are often you know they're they're very connected to their local um community and, and local environment. Um, so there are actually lots of very tangible local ways in which SMEs can, can get involved with um, helping um, the, the nature agenda. Um, and the other thing they can do sort of as I as I mentioned earlier is, is just ask questions, keep, you know, that even though the businesses themselves are small collectively, as you just mentioned, they make up most of most of the business community. And so collectively their voice is very strong. Um, so again, sort of asking um, asking the questions of, of their suppliers, um, being, um, you know, discerning buyers of, of um, the products that, that they need um, can just start to mainstream that message into the larger companies. Working together, I think there's, we need to find more forums in which businesses of different sizes who are part of the same supply chain can actually get together and figure out together how they can um, start to, to drive change um, rather than sort of each just looking at it from, from their level. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's a huge amount to be tapped into there. Um, and again, it comes back to, you know, businesses of people and people care um, and, and um, sort of do, do what we can now. Great, that's good. Um, Alex, any, any thoughts from a 
smaller company perspective, because I'm sure you must um, work with a lot of um, SMEs in your, in, your, in your supply chain. Yeah, I couldn't give you an exact number, but uh, yeah, they will make up a significant proportion of, uh, of our supply chain at least. Um, I think a key point in, from my view in here is to ensure that what we're asking of SMEs is proportionate to the scale of their impact as well, because some of them may actually have a larger impact than others. Um, <clears throat> and it's not always right to expect what you might expect of a um, you know, multinational to expect of, a, of an SME. Um, but, but Barrett, I mean, we've been members of uh, the Supply Chain Sustainability School for a number of years, and we work with our suppliers and subcontractors and, and ask of them to become members because that actually has quite a lot of resources that can help uh, answer some of these, what do I need to do, you know, checklist the, the guidance and, and training that uh, might otherwise not be accessible or easily uh, or easy to find because uh, a lot of these things are hosted by fairly small niche organisations which uh, SMEs might not always have the time to go and um, look out for. Um, but it is, it is absolutely important because I think about 75% of our supply chain is UK-based. Um, so that actually represents quite quite a lot of SMEs in uh, the UK alone. Um, so having, having that kind of guidance and setting those expectations from our point of view, but also from, from a reporting point of view is, is, uh, is key. But proportionality, clarity, consistency is, uh, is probably the key one for me. Great, thanks, Alex. Really good practical advice on that. So, um, and Rebecca? Yeah, the only thing I would add uh, to what uh, Kat and Alex said is that as an SME, you know, proactively engaging in biodiversity can be a differentiator for your business. And you should really think about it in a proactive sense, that this is something that will set you apart from other businesses. This is an indication of the quality and commitment of your business. Um, you know, whenever we work with companies, we just sort of beg them not to let their work just sit in an ESG report, right? This is, um, this is a value proposition of your company, and you should make sure that the market is very aware of, of the actions and the steps that you're taking. And hopefully that translates into the business results that you're looking for. Brilliant. Thanks much, Rebecca. Um... So great, some points there. I'm going to try and sum up in a minute. I'll do a quick round table and the last reflections in a, in a second before handing back to Chris. Um, a couple of things there, which I heard actually goes back to, I think Will mentioned right at the beginning about first, an interesting phrase in terms of first mover disadvantage uh, in terms of the costs of being that first mover. What I think that this whole area of Nate environment, by the way, is really interesting space. It's not a change at the moment um, because then Rebecca, you just highlighted about in terms of market differentiation for business. And I think what we're actually starting to see that actually some potential first mover advantages coming through for, for companies who are moving into this space. And uh, one of the key interesting drivers there is going to be some of the larger companies putting demands or, or expectations on in the supply chain to one, to be accountable, to show where they're getting their, getting their supplies from, where they're getting the products from. So sustainable certification, I think, is going to be an increasing, interesting driver. Um, and expectations for SMEs and others and other companies in the supply chain to be more sustainable. So I think it's going to be a really interesting shift over the next few years, how that changes. Um, because I think we're starting to see actually this space, which I haven't necessarily seen as being a competitive advantage for companies, is actually almost starting to move into that space at this, at this time. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this, it all pans out over the next few years. Obviously, we've got COP15. It'd be really fasc fascinating to see what comes out of COP15 and the negotiations there. Um, so um, in the last couple of minutes, perhaps we can just do a very quick round table of in terms of from the reflect from your discussions just now or reflection module generally, what's in your big takeaway? What's your big single advice suggestion you would give to our audience out there? Um, and perhaps I can start off with Will. So my big my big takeaway as always is just how incredibly diverse and vibrant uh, you know our business sector is. It almost doesn't really make sense to talk about a business sector, does it? I mean, it's it's just amazing, just this tiny panel and you know just a huge wealth of experience um, and you know different perspectives we've got. Um, but I think really uh, you know echoing that point from Mark that um, you know. Uh, we're 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 not necessarily at the start of a journey anymore. I think we're, we're we're close to the start of a journey, but I think the first steps have been taken. I think we're on that journey now, and I think that it's quite important that we keep that momentum going, um, and that you know we continue to kind of we need to set up quite quickly the right relationships so that we as a as a collective community can all continue to learn from each other. Um, and I think it's really important that we make the most of the CBD. Of course, great. Thank you much, Will. Brilliant. Um, no particular, um, Alex, no particular order. Um, I think 
if we, if we look back a few years to how climate reporting used to be quite niche and you know quantifying impacts on climate used to be quite a niche thing it's become front and center it's come to the fore and I, I think you know the same will be said of, of biodiversity reporting and, and quantifying a, a, a business's impacts on nature in the near future so um rather than shying away from it um now more than ever i think we need to start looking towards the future uh, but also the present and start making that uh, start taking those first steps brilliant thanks Matt, Alex. fantastic advice great um cat um i would say don't hold back from taking those first no regrets actions there's something that every business can do immediately um don't sit around and wait for, for regulations. And I think now it's about mainstreaming. Um, we've done this before for things like health and safety, which suddenly are now integrated into every part of every discussion in every business. And we can do the same for nature within quite a short time frame. And it really will be able to um, have a, a significant um, positive impact. Brilliant, thanks Kat. And Rebecca? Yes, just to echo what everyone else said that I think, you know, the conversation around nature is to, you know, some relief, I think, fully cemented as being a part of discourse moving forward for businesses. And so the more proactively you can get involved in that conversation and show action of your business, no matter how big or how, how small, as Kat just mentioned, it will, uh, it will contribute to this overall goal that we're trying to achieve. Because I, as Will said, I do think we're a couple of steps along the way. So you don't need to hesitate. You don't need to worry that this is a, a trendy topic uh, that, will, that will come and go. Um, this focus on nature is going to be around for decades. Brilliant. Thank you very much. All fantastic. Great. Advice there. So, um, so I'm going to finish off. Um, just say a huge thank you for the panelists and discussions there. Great discussions, some really good points. Hope you, the audience, have taken away some key messages as well. So, thank you to everybody. Chris, over to you. Thank you. Well, what a, what a fantastic session. Thanks very much, Mark, and thank you to all our speakers today. I, I found that extremely engaging. It's, it's really interesting how this connects to this wider discussion around resilient global value chains. A couple of things jumped to mind immediately. We made the point yesterday that. You know, there's no choice here uh, in biodiversity like there isn't in climate. No action is not an option. Uh, this is about taking those first steps. And there are very, very practical things that we can do, particularly through global value chains, whether that's collective action, putting pressure on suppliers and buyers uh, and, and, and working through ecosystems. That's, that's got a lot of parallels to the conversation tomorrow on digitalization. It's exactly the same approach. Uh, but again, yesterday, we talked an awful lot about that in terms of how do we work together as business, whether it's training, education, information, some of the things that Alex was talking about is highly relevant to that broader picture uh, on making our global value chains, in this case, greener and more sustainable. Uh, digital is obviously a big part of that using technology, whether it's data as well, really, really important. We get that technology into the system so we can get that accurate data coming in so, and make real life uh, decisions in real time. It's really, really important. So thank you so much to all of you uh, today for your time. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our event partners. Uh, there are a couple of forums uh, at the WTO for those trading uh, aficionados in, in the audience. Uh, there's two forums at the WTO that are on trade environment. One is a slightly more formal structure actually chaired by the UK. And the other one is a, a slightly less formal, more informal uh, um, forum, which is actually quite interesting because it creates a slightly bigger space for exploration and dialogue and ideas. Uh, so those are two spaces down in Geneva that we should leverage uh, and, and use that as a mechanism to then align the trade frameworks up with, in this case, biodiversity, but similarly on, on climate too. So thanks, every, everybody. Um, that's the end of the, this morning session. The next session starts off at 12 o'clock British Standard Time. That's going to be all about leveraging digital innovation to empower SMEs. So very relevant to this, but specifically around the climate agenda and looking at digital tools uh, and how they can operate and support companies uh, to bring those ecosystems with them, led 